Pre-Sedation Assessment Phase by Dr. Patricia Scherer in collaboration with the Society for Pediatric Sedation. Welcome to the Society for Pediatric Sedation's online provider course on pre-sedation assessment. Our goal for this lecture is to review the different levels of sedation, to talk through how to perform a pre-sedation risk assessment, the equipment needed to conduct procedural sedation in a safe manner, and the skill set needed by sedation team members. We will finish by reviewing a systematic approach to providing safe and effective pediatric procedural sedation. First, we will review some general considerations regarding the scope of sedation, including defining different levels of sedation which are important for planning your medication regimen, monitoring, etc. We will discuss patient factors that are important in pre-sedation planning, including health history, key points on the physical examination of the patient, NPO status, and guidelines, and the American Society of Anesthesiologists Physical Status Scoring System. In addition, we will discuss important provider and procedure factors, including team member skills, necessary monitors, and other equipment, and a brief word on documentation. We will look at relevant environmental concerns, including available rescue resources. And finally, we will go through a brief overview of matching the sedation medication regimen to these factors, and will continue to expand on that base in subsequent lectures. The Boy Scout motto is particularly applicable to this phase of providing sedation. Be prepared. The pre-sedation phase is the assessment, preparation, and planning phase. This phase allows for sedation risk assessment, preparation for the sedation and planning for the sedation, including taking the time to review the goals for the sedation and for the procedure. Safety is our top priority. Clearly, we want to get the test or procedure completed, but we also want to keep the child as comfortable as is safely possible. So we use the pre-sedation assessment phase to plan for accomplishing these goals. The best way for us to accomplish our goals is by carefully considering the various factors that contribute to a successful sedation. Foundational to this process are those factors associated with the program itself, namely the institutional setting or environment, the sedation team itself, and the organizational structure of the program, including its policies and procedures. These form the pool from which we plan and draw resources. Next, we must consider the factors specific to the situation. The patient, having reviewed underlying history and risk factors, the procedure and its associated needs, such as immobility and or pain control, and the pharmacology, what drugs will be optimal for this case. When these factors come together, quality sedation care can occur. Let's start by discussing some initial general considerations. For each sedation encounter, we should consider the age of the child as well as their underlying developmental level and personality in our planning. For example, the same procedure, let's say a PICC line placement, may require three very different sedation regimens for three different eight-year-old girls. One may do quite well with topical anesthetics and an expert child life specialist providing distraction. One may require a bit more anxiolysis with nitrous oxide. And one anxious or developmentally different child may in fact require deep sedation in order to accomplish insertion of the PICC line. We definitely recommend including emotional support and distraction techniques, ideally by child life specialist colleagues. We also strongly encourage the use of adjuncts, such as topical and local anesthetics, whenever possible. We also need to consider the type of procedure being performed. Will it be painful, suggesting the use of additional analgesics? Will the child need to be quite immobile, such as for an extended MRI scan, suggesting the need for a deeper level of sedation in the younger child? We'll talk more about these considerations later on as well. Let's move on in our discussion by reviewing the levels of sedation. Webster's Dictionary defines sedation as the inducing of a relaxed, easy state. It is this intent for alteration in level of consciousness and perception of environment that is the hallmark of procedural sedation. 
Minimal sedation is often best described as anxiolysis, with perhaps some blunting of appropriate verbal responsiveness, but maintenance of intact pain response, airway and breathing control, and circulatory function. Moderate sedation involves more significant blunting of the responsiveness to verbal interaction, as well as some alteration in responsiveness to pain. Airway tone and respiration may be somewhat impaired, but circulatory function should remain intact. Under deep sedation, responsiveness to verbal stimulation is lost, and responsiveness to pain is significantly impaired, though still present. Deeply sedated children are at risk for impairment in airway control and respiratory function, as well as some impact on the cardiovascular system. General anesthesia involves loss of response to pain, accompanied by significantly impacted airway and respiratory function. It is very important to note that these levels of sedation are a continuum. There are no clear, bright lines or defined clinical boundaries separating the levels when you are in the midst of a sedated procedure. We will continue to emphasize the concept of the sedation continuum throughout this course. Looking at each level in more detail, patients who are minimally sedated typically have some degree of impairment in cognitive functioning and coordination, but they can offer an appropriate response to simple verbal commands and physical stimulation. Airway protective reflexes, breathing, and circulation are maintained. Although we must be cautious in providing examples for the levels, since each individual drug may provide a different level of sedation for different patients, even at similar dosing, in pediatrics we often see a minimal level of sedation in a teenager who receives a dose of an oral benzodiazepine, such as oral midazolam for anxiolysis or in a younger child who receives inhaled nitrous oxide to facilitate peripheral IV placement. A child who is moderately sedated should still have blunted but purposeful response to verbal command or tactile stimulation. There may be associated alterations in airway tone and ventilatory responsiveness, but airway protective reflexes and circulatory function are usually maintained. Moderate sedation can be challenging to achieve in pediatrics, but perhaps a good example would be a child who has received enteral chlorohydrate or dexmedetomidine for a sedated echocardiogram. Combination of a benzodiazepine and an opioid may also result in a depth of sedation consistent with moderate sedation. Deep sedation is associated with further blunting of the response to painful stimulation, as well as increased risk for impairment in natural airway control and respiratory responsiveness. Cardiovascular function may at times be impacted as well. Many of us provide deep sedation as the bulk of our patient care experiences, such as children receiving propofol for MRI scans and intravenous ketamine for fracture reductions. Though we will talk a bit more about the uniqueness of ketamine in further lectures. General anesthesia removes the response to painful stimulation, and as such, airway reflexes and breathing are often impaired, leading to artificial airway placement and or assisted ventilation. Again, we must be clear, using large enough doses and or combinations of most of the medications we'll be discussing can lead to a state of deep sedation or even general anesthesia. To reiterate, these definitions are somewhat arbitrary and do not come with clear, bright lines between the levels, especially in clinical situations. Also, different levels of sedation are in no way specific to any particular one of the medications we will be discussing, since it is not always possible to predict the effect that a given dose of a given medication will have on a specific patient in a specific clinical situation. Because of the different associated risks to airway and respiratory function, the different levels of sedation do require different levels of experience and expertise for patient management. Joint Commission regulations state that a provider of sedation must be able to rescue a patient from one level of sedation deeper than what is intended. So for example, for a patient receiving moderate sedation, the sedation provider must be able to support the patient's ventilation and provide airway rescue adjuncts, including endotracheal intubation, if they are needed. For patients receiving deep sedation, practitioners must be additionally competent to manage an unstable cardiovascular system. Now let's move on to evaluation of the patient. We need to consider a number of different factors about the child during our evaluation, including their underlying health history, 
relevant findings on physical examination, their NPO status, and their American Society of Anesthesiologists physical status score. We will look at each of these categories in more detail in the next several slides. In terms of health history, we primarily need to consider factors that could impact the sedation. As we have discussed, age, developmental level, and personality are all important considerations. Weight and body mass percentile for age are very important to review, since we know that obesity is associated with an increased risk for airway and respiratory related adverse events and interventions. Allergies should also be considered. We will speak a little more about the ongoing controversy regarding the association of propofol with egg anaphylaxis in future lectures. Evaluating the child's medication history is also important, especially to consider medication interactions and potential alterations in response to the planned sedation regimen. For example, anticonvulsant medications may alter anticipated patient response to sedatives, such as benzodiazepines and barbiturates. We know that there are a number of genetic syndromes associated with risk of underlying airway anomalies, altered respiratory mechanics, and other issues that may impact the sedation process. For example, trisomy 21 is associated with macroglossia and poor upper airway tone. Goldenhar syndrome is associated with an inability to fully open the mouth and successfully endotracheally intubate via direct laryngoscopy. Tuberous sclerosis patients, especially infants, may have intracardiac rhabdomyomas associated with potential obstruction of the left ventricular outflow tract. We could spend a number of hours just reviewing these associations. There is a reference article included at the end of this talk, and there are a number of other similar articles and texts available for reference. We also know that sedation of former premature infants and even term neonates can be associated with an increased risk of apnea due to immaturity of the respiratory control center. Underlying asthma and chronic lung disease can increase the risk for bronchospasm, desaturation, and other respiratory complications during sedation. Obstructive sleep apnea at baseline is not surprisingly associated with an increased risk of our upper airway obstruction, desaturation, and the need for rescue interventions. Many of the medications and imaging modalities we use are contraindicated in the developing fetus, so pregnancy status is important to be aware of. Current health issues, such as recent illnesses, can impact sedation safety. Upper respiratory infections, especially those associated with significant nasal congestion, productive cough, and or a history of reactive airway disease, are associated with the occurrence of cough, upper airway congestion, desaturation, bronchospasm, and apnea during sedation and anesthesia of children. Recent or active vomiting increases the risk for vomiting during the procedure with the attendant risk of aspiration. It can be very helpful to explore the child and family's experiences with previous sedation and anesthesia, both to provide additional reference for the current experience and to review any complications. It often helps to ask fairly concrete questions about these experiences, such as, were there any problems putting in the breathing tube? Did she get happy or upset with the pink medicine, i.e. midazolam, that they gave her to drink beforehand? And so forth. In discussing the sedation-based review of systems with the child and family, we focus more specifically on airway and respiratory concerns, asking questions about a history of snoring, wheezing, cold symptoms, and the like. Although we usually are hoping not to provide airway interventions, it is important to review mechanical risks beforehand, such as loose teeth, braces, and other orthodontic appliances. It's particularly bad form to find the rubber bands when the suction catheter becomes filled with them. Review of baseline cardiovascular status is very helpful, as many of the medications we use can negatively impact cardiovascular performance, especially in the tenuous child. GE reflux disease is diagnosed quite frequently in the pediatric population, but for those patients with true reflux, we do consider the risk of aspiration and laryngospasm, especially with any risk of delayed gastric emptying. 
Finally, impairment in underlying renal and or hepatic function can dramatically alter metabolism and excretion of a number of different medications. For example, the clinical effects of benzodiazepines can be quite prolonged in patients with hepatic failure. Now let's move on to important findings on the pre-sedation physical examination. The Joint Commission does mandate baseline vital signs as well as repeated vital signs immediately before the procedure. It is helpful to know the patient's baseline systemic oxygen saturations, respiratory rate, heart rate, and blood pressure to allow for trending during the procedure. Patient temperature monitoring may be indicated by patient history or may be clinically indicated for procedures with the potential for swings in environmental temperature. During our examination, we focus primarily on sedation-relevant systems, such as the airway, respiratory tract, cardiovascular, and nervous systems. Since most clinically significant sedation-related adverse events are upper airway in nature, particular focus will be placed on properly examining the upper airway. In examining the upper airway, we are looking for findings that would limit our ability to keep the child's airway patent with positioning, suctioning, etc., and for factors that would limit our ability to rescue the child with bag valve mask ventilation and endotracheal intubation if needed. As such, it is important to evaluate for any craniofacial abnormalities, unusual dentition, alteration in pharyngeal structures, tonsillar or hypertrophy, or limitations to neck mobility. The Malampati score is the most often used system to evaluate the airway in cooperative adults, and we'll review that score two slides on. However, formal Malampati evaluation requires cooperative opening of the mouth, which doesn't always happen with our smaller patients. Another way to assess the adequacy of airway size in terms of the ability to open the airway for bag valve mask ventilation and to visualize the glottic inlet if needed for intubation is to assess the thyromental or cricomental distance. In adults with normal airway architecture, we can put at least three finger widths in the space between the thyroid cartilage and the tip of the chin. Take a moment and check this on yourself. Obviously, this distance has to be modified and somewhat ballparked for younger children, but ideally we should be able to get three of our finger widths between the thyroid cartilage and the tip of the chin down to younger school-aged children, and two finger widths even in many infants. Again, the space reflects the ability to open and view the airway if required. Another important consideration, especially in children, is the tonsil score. We know that increasing tonsil size is associated with an increased risk of airway obstruction and difficulty maintaining a patent natural airway, especially in the supine position. Note that a score of zero are tonsils that fit within the tonsillar fossa, whereas four plus tonsils occupy greater than 75% of the space between the tonsillar pillars. Again, the Malampati score is the gold standard for upper airway assessment in cooperative older children and adults. As the picture demonstrates, the Malampati class correlates with the ability to visualize the glottic inlet during direct laryngoscopy. For younger children, this can also be estimated by getting a reasonable look at their mouth opening while they are screaming at you. In general, a high 3 to 4 Malampati classification associated with any other abnormality of the head and neck is indicative of an airway that may well be difficult to manage, particularly if endotracheal intubation is required. The patient is classified a Malampati 1 if the examiner can see down to the tonsillar pillars. Class 2 if the examiner can visualize just the full uvula, class three if only the soft palate can be seen, and class four if the hard palate is all that is visualized. In examining the respiratory system, we evaluate breath sounds for symmetry and presence of any adventitious sounds, such as wheezing, congestion, or decreased air entry, restriction to chest wall movement by adipose tissue, mass, or external bracing like a TLSO may lead to further issues with spontaneous ventilation when sedated. From the cardiovascular standpoint, many sedatives can decrease cardiac output that could be concerning for children with already borderline perfusion or compromised oxygen delivery. There are several different angles to consider from the neurologic perspective. 
First of all, we need to assess the child's ability to control airway tone and secretions. Will they be able to maintain a patent airway when sedated? Will they be able to handle any secretions that develop? It is also important to document baseline neurologic status so that this may be referred back to and returned to baseline confirmed on the post-sedation assessment. Finally, we need to be sure that from a neurodevelopmental perspective, we will be able to keep the patient, their family members, and our team members safe throughout the course of the procedure. Adult-sized patients with significant cognitive delays and behavioral issues may require different levels of preparation and environments of care to keep everyone safe. There has been much recent discussion regarding the need for prolonged NPO times for sedated procedures in children that do not require airway manipulation. For now, there is no definitive data on risk, and so for elective non-emergent procedural sedation in children, we will continue to follow the American Society of Anesthesiologists guidelines. The ASA guidelines recommend that patients be NPO for a minimum of two hours for clear liquids, four hours for breast milk, six hours for infant formula, non-human milk, and non-fat solids, and eight hours for a full meal. Finally, as part of our pre-sedation assessment, we assign patients an ASA physical status score. This scoring system was developed by the ASA to aid in assessments of anesthesia risk. And we know that risks of sedation and anesthesia, adverse events and interventions, are higher in patients with higher ASA scores, typically greater than or equal to an ASA level of three or greater. Although this is known to a relatively subjective scoring system with inherent flaws, it is currently the best available risk scoring system for procedural sedation. An ASA class one patient is a child who is essentially completely healthy with no major underlying medical issues. Examples would be a toddler requiring procedural sedation for a follow-up auditory brain stem response hearing test, or a child with no previous history who requires procedural sedation for reduction in casting of a forearm fracture. An ASA class two patient is a child with known underlying systemic disease that does not result in significant functional limitation. This group comprises the bulk of pediatric procedural sedation patients and includes examples such as a child with well-controlled asthma who requires sedation for a laceration repair, a toddler with an underlying seizure disorder but no recent seizures who requires sedation for MRI imaging, or a teen in maintenance therapy for leukemia who requires sedation and analgesia for a follow-up bone marrow aspirate and biopsy. An ASA class three patient is a child with more significant and active underlying systemic disease that is associated with some notable degree of functional limitation. Examples might include a child with chronic persistent asthma who requires sedation for an unrelated procedure, a toddler with ongoing active seizures and neurologic impairment who requires sedation for a brain MRI while hospitalized, an obese teen who requires sedation for dental work, or a child with newly diagnosed leukemia requiring sedation for their day eight lumbar puncture. ASA-4 patients are typically cared for in an emergency department or critical care environment, if not in the OR, but may require procedural sedation to facilitate life-saving procedures, such as cardioversion or chest tube placement. By the ASA's definition, these patients have severe systemic disease that is a constant threat to life. In summary, the ASA physical status scoring system is a broad classification scheme, but it does give us at least some framework for categorizing patient risk. Now let's switch gears and talk about team and setting, environmental factors that impact sedation quality and safety. And we continue to rely heavily on our be prepared motto. We need to consider our answers to the following questions. Who are the members of our sedation team and what are their skill sets? What monitors and equipment do we need both to perform the sedated procedure itself and to rescue if there are any problems? What are our rescue resources in case of an emergency? To start, in terms of our team members, the Joint Commission states that appropriate physiologic monitoring and continuous observation by personnel not directly involved with the procedure allow for accurate and rapid diagnosis and initiation of appropriate rescue interventions. 
or we need separate folks specifically designated for the sedation who bear no responsibility for performing the procedure. Remember that the Joint Commission also states that providers and teams must be able to rescue a patient from a level of sedation deeper than what is intended, meaning that we need to have the expertise, the equipment, and the resources for that deeper level of sedation immediately available. Sedation team members should possess some degree of experience with the entire process of procedural sedation, including the medication regimen and its titration, and recognition and management of potential adverse effects. Team members should have successfully participated in current basic and advanced life support training for pediatric airway and emergency management as well. Next, we move to consideration of the physical environment or the setting of the sedation. In terms of equipment and supplies, there are some basic airway intervention supplies that have a number of different associated acronyms. One of the more popular is SOAP ME, which covers suction, oxygen, airway equipment, pharmacy, monitors, and extra equipment. Reviewing this list in more detail, in terms of suction, we should have both Yonkar and smaller bore suction catheters available, as well as functional vacuum apparatus. We should have a guaranteed adequate oxygen supply system with flow meters. These should be checked for working condition before the sedation begins each and every time. A variety of airway equipment should be available at the sedation provider's disposal, all age and size appropriate for the patient in question. These include nasopharyngeal airways, or trumpets, oral airways, laryngeal mask airways, which are the ASA recommended rescue devices for patients who can neither be bag valve mask ventilated nor intubated successfully in an emergency situation. Additionally, laryngoscope blades and handles, endotracheal tubes, face masks, self-inflating or anesthesia style bags for hand ventilation, and so on. We should be able to answer the following questions for every sedation. What would we need available to manage apnea? What about laryngospasm? What would we need to intubate the child's trachea? Is all of this equipment easily and rapidly accessible? How quickly could we access and deliver emergency medications, including neuromuscular blocking agents in the setting of critical laryngospasm? We will review sedative and analgesic medications in the next lecture. But in terms of preparation, our chosen armamentarium should be rapidly accessible, including repeat doses if required, as well as emergency medications and reversal agents. We will also discuss monitoring at length in a subsequent lecture, but for now, based on the level of sedation, we need to have available pulse oximetry, cardiovascular monitoring, and capnography, all in working order with power cords and or charged batteries. Many sedation programs have developed a pre-sedation checklist that is reviewed along with a standard timeout procedure to ensure that all equipment and monitors have been evaluated prior to each sedation encounter. Other equipment that might come in handy include IV supplies, lab supplies, fluids, and medication sheets. Finally, availability of rescue equipment is another key point in sedation safety. We know that adverse events are most common in systems that do not have adequate, reliable emergency support. So as we are preparing for each sedation encounter, it is critical to ask, who will be our rescue net if we need assistance? How quickly will they respond? What additional resources do they possess? Advanced airway skills? Will they need additional equipment and supplies? If so, are these available? We should review and ideally practice with high fidelity simulation our ability to respond rapidly and fully to a sedation-related emergency in any area in which we offer sedation services. Finally, as part of the pre-sedation preparation, we must be prepared to provide an appropriate level of documentation for each sedation. This documentation mirrors the organizational structure and basis of the sedation process. The American Academy of Pediatrics states that informed consent must be obtained and documented according to applicable policies. Also, families and guardians must receive appropriate information and instructions, including the overall sedation plan and expectations, anticipated changes during and after the sedation, activity and diet instructions, as well as contact information for questions or concerns after discharge.
Prior to beginning the sedation, the provider must document a focused pre-sedation evaluation. Important elements include relevant history, previous sedation or anesthesia issues, relevant review of systems, a focused physical examination, commenting particularly on the airway, NPO status, ASA score, and the procedural sedation plan. We must document performance of a timeout, performed prior to beginning the sedated procedure. During the sedation, we must keep a time-based record of medications administered, the level of sedation, vital signs, and any adverse events and their associated management. The American Society of Anesthesiologists has similar guidelines for monitored anesthesia care, including procedural sedation, with similar recommendations for time-based documentation of sedation score and relevant vital signs based on level of sedation. The ASA also states that parameters should be monitored and documented until the child has returned to their pre-sedation baseline, and in similar fashion to the AAP recommendations, including documentation before the beginning of the procedure, after administration of any sedative or analgesic agents, at regular intervals during the procedure, while recovering, and prior to discharge from the recovery area. So, let's try and put this all together. Who is a good procedure sedation candidate for us? In general, non-anesthesia-based sedation programs are caring for ASA 1 or 2 patients with a natural airway-based sedation. That doesn't mean we can't or don't sedate more complex patients, but we need to recognize and keep in mind that higher risk patients and deeper levels of sedation imply the need for more intensive monitoring and a greater skill set as well as an ability for rescue. We encourage case-by-case -case consideration of all factors, patient, procedure, provider, and environment, in order to decide who we are adequately prepared to sedate. In general, there are no defined time limits for natural airway procedural sedation, but we do need to be aware that total sedation time of greater than around two to three hours begins to be associated with a higher risk of adverse respiratory and cardiovascular events. Also, there are airway maintenance risks associated with numerous position changes and procedure locations that must be considered as well. In conclusion, from our pre-sedation assessment, we should know that our patients seem like reasonable candidates for our team. This is based on a review of patient factors, as well as our team's experience and abilities the necessary monitoring and emergency rescue equipment, our medication options, and our rescue resources in case of emergency. Please help us improve the content by providing us with some feedback.